Welcome to the May 2023 edition of Hunt Cat Mail, where I'll respond to viewer questions and comments. My mailbox is getting really full these days, much more than it did in the past. And I think it's getting so full it's reached that point where I can only pick a limited number of letters to include in Hunt Cat Mail. So I apologize if I didn't get to your letter in this episode. Well, May is the month where we start fishing the high Sierras again, but uh, the snowpack is just so high right now that I don't think we'll be able to hit the backcountry until probably late August this year. I filmed this yesterday at 40,000 feet elevation, and this is the South Central Sierra Nevadas, which usually only has snow on the really high peaks and is mostly bare in late May. I also want to thank Dan and Joe, who are uh, fans of my channel and instantly recognized me while I was in Idaho this month. And I also want to uh, say hi to another fan who approached me at LAX, who was on his way to Cancun. But uh, I'm sorry I didn't get your name, but uh, I always love meeting fans of this channel. Well, enough babble. Let's get to May's mail. And our first question for May is from Cody. Cody wrote, I watched your video on the 35 Wayland build, and it inspired me to work on building a rifle for myself, a Winchester Model 70 Alaskan chambered in 8mm Remington Magnum. In your 35 Wayland project video, you chose to go for a 23-inch number 4 contour barrel from Pacnor with a 1 in 14 twist rate. I'm looking into getting a number 6 contour in a 27-inch barrel with a 1 in 14 twist rate. Is that the recommended barrel for an 8mm Remington Magnum? If not, what would you recommend? You know, from a hunting standpoint, Cody, the 8mm Rem Mag kind of doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, you get a whole lot of recoil and inefficiency to get the same thing as a 338 Win Mag. You know, basically, they both launch a 200 grain bullet over 3,000 feet per second. But the 338 Win Mag does it in a shorter action with a uh, wider bullet. Also, 338 Win Mag ammunition and reloading components are going to be a lot easier to find. But, you know, sometimes it's cool to be different, and the 8mm Magnum is definitely different. Having said that, you need to do a lot more research before taking on this project, I think. You know, you're way off on your barrel specs, and uh, you might have gotten in a little bit over your head on this. The standard twist rate for 8mm Remington Magnum is 1 in 10, and I definitely stick with that. You know, just because my 35 Wayland build had a 1 in 14 twist doesn't mean that that applies to other cartridges. Never copy build specs from guns that shoot different cartridges. Also, you need to consider that that number six barrel contour that you want to use for your eight millimeter build will be about one inch thick in diameter and taper down to about three quarters of an inch at the muzzle, you know, which is pretty damn thick for a for a hunting rifle. For a, a, a three twenty three diameter bullet, you know that barrel is going to have a wall thickness of almost a quarter inch, you know, around the hole. And that's way too thick for a hunting rifle, I think. A number three or number four contour barrel will probably serve you much better for an eight millimeter hunting rifle. Also, I'd opt for a 25 or 26 inch barrel for your eight millimeter Remington Magnum build. There's, there's really no use in going 27 inches on that. And our next letter is from Austin from Pennsylvania. Austin wrote, as I write this, our turkey season finally started up here in Penn's Woods, and I just got done watching your April hump camp mail after a morning of getting rained on. Your remarks about the 8.6 blackout reminded me of the most incredible bullshit story I've ever heard. Supposedly, this man who owns a gun shop and shooting range near me shot everything up, and including, up to and including elephants with a 220 Swift. <laughs> Sounds about right. 
bullshit, you know, uh, bullshit artists are just legendary within the hunting, fishing, and shooting community. Trust me, I know lots of people where I consider our conversations more entertainment value than a learning experience. Internet platforms like YouTube, you know, internet video platforms like YouTube, have made it really hard for the bullshit artists these days because people expect to see videos or pics of the things you claim to have done. So in modern times, the old guys are usually the biggest offenders when it comes to bullshitting because they come from an age where nothing could be proven or disproven. And even if you take a really objective look, you know, at <clears throat> past famous people in the firearm industry, you know, you'll see that guys like Elmer Keith and Peter's Capstick were just legendary bullshit artists. But, uh, you know, there are fun stories and uh, Hunting Elephant with the 220 Swift is a, is a pretty fun story, I guess. Um, on your uh, 8.6 blackout topic, unfortunately, there is many places in Africa who many operations in Africa who conduct hunts and let Americans shoot animals with basically whatever the hell they want. You know, blowguns, crossbows, pistols, air guns, slingshots, 8.6 blackouts, and 220 swifts. You know, anything goes for the right price in some places in Africa, and that's really sad. And our next letter is from Greg. Greg wrote, after watching your videos, I saw that you bias toward controlled round feed rifles like the Winchester Model 70. I would prefer a Model 70 myself, but saw that they can be quite pricey, either new or used. Do you have any experience with the Zastava M70 bolt-action rifles? Well, yes, I have owned one and worked on several others. The one I owned was sold under the Charles Daly name. On all of the examples I've handled, the action on those guns was pretty gritty and rough, and the surfaces had many machine marks and blemishes on them. You know, uh, the rifles that were sold under the Inner Arms and Remington name had a little bit better fit and finish, I think, but uh, many of the straight Zastava rifles sold today are really rough, in my opinion. You know, you ask for my opinion, and I'm going to give it to you. I'd save, you know, for a few more months if you can, and buy the Winchester. But buy once, cry once. And our next question is from Omar from El Paso, Texas. Actually, Becca, my wife, is in El Paso right now. Omar wrote, First of all, I want to thank you for your videos. I've learned a lot from them, and they are very interesting. I'm booked for safari to Mozambique for Buffalo this coming October. I bought two MTM dry boxes for the ammo, 60 rounds of 300 Win Mag and 60 of 375 H&H. After I weigh it, it goes over the 11 pound, five kilogram allowed by the airline. I never traveled to Africa, so let me ask you this. In your experience, do they really weigh the ammo? And also, what type of locks did you use for the ammo boxes? TSA approved or regular locks? Well, I'll start my reply by stating that I think you're bringing way too much ammunition, Omar. You know, nobody is going to shoot 120 rounds on a buffalo hunt with a little bit of planes game thrown in. You know, I'd, I'd probably take half that and keep it all in one MTM dry box. You know, 60 to 70 rounds will easily fit in one dry box, and th that's all you're going to need. Your ammo will also, you know, and, and yes, I'll emphatically state this, I have had airlines many times weigh my ammo at check-in, so don't try to sneak it past them. Your ammo will also probably be inspected at your destination to make sure that the head stamps match what you claim to have in the ammo boxes. Also, Make sure the number of rounds that you claim on your form actually matches what you actually have. That's also very important, and I've seen people get in trouble there. Um, for the locks, always use a TSA-approved lock on your ammo case so the, uh, the TSA has access to it. Uh, for your gun case, though, 
Never use TSA locks on that. Use at least two tough non-TSA locks for your gun case. The TSA does not have permission to open your gun case. I feel like I'm just blowing through these questions today. And our next letter is from Alfred. Alfred wrote, Words cannot express the gratitude I feel for the truthful, informative, and expert content you disseminate in your channel. I'm a 58-year-old immigrant to the USA, but new to the hunting and fishing culture. My outdoor exposure is limited to family glamour camping. <laughs> Since the pandemic and resulting cultural revolution that we've experienced in the USA, I've taken to collecting firearms of all types in the presumption that food shortages and the climate alarmist farming and ranching restrictions may soon ensue here as they have in the Netherlands and Indonesia. Although this concept is more a victory of hope over reality for my limited skill set, I hope you agree my fears are not totally unfounded. It's a great letter, Alfred, and your fears of a cultural shift and climate alarmism are not unfounded, in my opinion. Now is the time to learn to be self-sufficient. Obtaining firearms and getting formal training on their safe and effective use is just a small aspect of self-sufficiency, though. I think people concentrate on that too much. Growing your own food, uh, stockpiling medical supplies, you know, having supplies to repair your home and vehicle, um, having off-the-grid power, water purification, having a means to communicate off the grid, maybe like ham radio, uh, and smart financial planning are even more important than guns. The guns are just for hunting and for keeping what you already have. But information is the greatest asset for survival. One day, the internet will either go down or it'll be under strict government control. So you won't be able to Google simple things like how to treat a fever or how to repair the plumbing in your home, how to catch fish or how to fix your truck. Get books now on how to do anything. As I stated in a past hunt camp mail, most of the wisdom that was on the internet before about 2010 has already been purged and is no longer available. Digital information is very temporary and fleeting. You know, even this video that you're watching right now probably won't be around 10 years from now. But when you buy a book, the information in this book isn't fleeting and it's yours forever. Big governments don't really want people to be self-sufficient because self-sufficient people can't be controlled because they really have no need for government. If you look at most uh, millennials and Gen Zers today, they have absolutely no skills to make it on their own in this world. And I feel like this is by design. Our government has basically canceled auto shop and wood shop and metal shop in favor of critical race theory for our children. You know, they discourage our youth from becoming Boy Scouts or even being competitive or strong. Young people are being conditioned to be dependents of the state. The government is right now, you know, a, uh, alluding to your fears, the government right now is trying to crush small farms and independent growers, and they're attacking family-owned ranching operations at an increased rate. As we speak, our government is trying to remove cash from the system and our ability to barter as a means of trade. You know, they want to take control of your water wells and your solar power. You know, government wants to neuter any thought of defending yourself or feeding yourself or being responsible for your own health. But in the end, the humble book will be the undoing of tyrants, as it always has. And our next letter is from fan favorite Mick in Australia. Mick wrote, do you own or have you ever hunted with pump action or lever action shotguns and rifles? What is your opinion of them? And as a side note, here in Oz, under my category of firearms license, I am prohibited from owning a pump action shotgun, but I can lawfully own a pump action rifle in any caliber. Go figure. Also, just so you know, I could feel the love in your Hawaii video 
all the way down under. I had a warm, fuzzy feeling in my cockles, mate. <laughs> Keep up the great work. Your cockles, huh? <laughs> Mick, I, I've done many years of hunting with pump-action shotguns. In fact, my favorite shotgun of all time is the Winchester Model 12. My first shotgun I ever owned was a Remington 870, and I put down thousands of birds, squirrels, and rabbits with those pump shotguns over the years, and I still use them on occasion. I've also done a fair bit of deer hunting with my old Marlin. This was my grandpa's old Marlin 336, and this thing has a lot of history with the deer populations of Idaho, and I just love this gun. But uh, yeah, I do use pump and lever action guns a lot, you know, and I'll have to say, Mick, they give my cockles that fuzzy feeling you were talking about. <laughs> and our next letter is from Carl in North Dakota. Carl wrote, I realize you are probably bombarded with silly video ideas daily. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I am. But I'm curious if you have any experience with bow hunting and how technology has changed throughout the life of hunting. I'm relatively young, 35 years old, but have already seen bow hunting techniques changing and adapting. I see urban hunters now and hunters taking 90 yard shots, which I consider ridiculously out of my abilities. This is my first email to you, but your unique angle on things prompted me to send this because I see many mainstream bow hunting channels promoting 60, 70, and even 90 yard shots on live game. To me, this isn't what bow hunting is about. Bow hunting is the most intimate and challenging of hunting methods and was employed by Native Americans not only as a means of survival, but as a test of manhood, which the current generation and society have little to no regard for. Great way to end that letter. It's so true. You know, Carl, uh, bow hunting, for some reason, is still a very controversial subject in hunting circles. You know, which isn't helped by these extreme long shots that guys are taking these days, which, of course, is also increasing wounding rates. <laughs> Watching deer with arrows sticking out of their backs running across your property isn't a good look for bow hunting. Many countries have banned bow hunting for ethical considerations, so most of the international community really looks down on bow hunting, especially when they see Americans doing it over bait. Unfortunately, Carl, the intimacy of bow hunting that you want to preserve is usually overshadowed by TV personalities like Keith Warren and Tim Wells. And this is really unfortunate. You know, you see the same thing in rifle hunting, the rifle hunting world too, you know, with the best of the West guys and people like that. While I, I haven't picked up my bow personally in years, I do have a lot to say on the subject, so perhaps a video on this is in the future. We'll see. Thanks for the letter. And our next letter is from Andrew. Andrew wrote, did you start your children off with smaller deer cartridges like the 243? I'm hoping to get my son a nice deer rifle in 243. I... I basically started my kids off shooting rimfire rifles at targets and then moved up to a bolt action 223 at targets, you know, then up to a 25 out 6. By the time my kids were 16, they were shooting 308 and 30 out 6 and preferred that over the lighter calibers. But uh, the 243 will definitely kill a deer. But uh, I like cartridges that a young hunter can grow into as they age. And I think the quarter bores or around like the 6.5 Creedmoor is a great starter cartridge for youth hunters because they can grow into it. But you know, the 243 works too. Um, I do plan to do a video soon on youth hunting. So stay tuned for that. And our next letter is from John in Australia. John asked, what advice would you give for hunters Traveling internationally with prescription medication. That's a great question and probably something I should have covered in my Africa Q&A video, but I didn't. My advice is to leave all prescription medication 
and even over-the-counter medicine in their original containers. Don't repackage them. If you don't do this, you know, they, they might throw them away at best or accuse you of smuggling drugs at worst. Always leave all medicine in its original container or packaging. Also, keeping your original prescription with you is very wise. Now let's talk about, um, along the same lines here, let's talk about pain medications that contain controlled substances. By international treaty, most countries do allow visitors to take a, a small quantity of prescription narcotics, but not all countries are on board with this treaty. And in some countries that are on in this treaty, you know, they might have some badge heavy law enforcement agents that don't care and you might end up in jail. So I wouldn't want to be per personally, I wouldn't want to be in Africa, South America or the Middle East when a drug sniffing dog at the airport lights up on your carry on with opiates in it. <laughs> You know, I, I wouldn't travel with controlled substances at all personally. You know, in reality, you shouldn't be hunting while you're under the influence of those anyways, right? And our next letter is from Vernon in San Diego, California. Vernon wrote, What is your saltwater fishing outlook for California and Baja waters this year? Is it finally tuna time? <laughs> you probably already know the answer to this one, Vernon. 2023 is going to be an epic El Nino year. I think 2023 has a chance to be the greatest tuna and dorado season that we've ever seen in California. You know, I think it's going to be a lot better than the 1998 and 2015 El Ninos that we had. You know, I, I did probably expect to see yellowfin tuna and marlin as far north as Morro Bay, you know. Maybe even yellowtail and white sea bass in the San Francisco Bay Area and, you know, schools of Wahoo at Catalina Island. California will be a saltwater fishing paradise this season. But remember, as much as we benefit from this El Nino thing, it's going to be really devastating in some places. Indonesia and Australia will get extreme droughts and some places down south will get extreme flooding. You know, the Midwest and northern regions of the United States and Canada might also get really hot. So many other places will experience extreme hardships due to this major El Nino system we're going to have. But yes, it will be tuna time here in California for sure. And our next question is from Michael in Vista, California. Michael wrote, I admire your efforts and dedication towards your passion for hunting and travel. I need to dedicate more of my time away from the office and focus on making an effort for at least a few hunting adventures on the African continent before I'm too damn old. Good attitude. A recommendation or two for outfitters would be appreciated if you don't mind. Well, I usually don't recommend specific outfitters or destinations in Africa. Things are in constant flux on the African continent. You know, one day a country's safe and stable, and, you know, the next day it might be, let's just say, the opposite of that. You know, one year an outfitter might be at the top of the game, and then the next year they might manage their money poorly and go to shit. I mean, you don't know. Many of the outfitters that I would have sent you to six years ago, I probably wouldn't recommend today. You know, I, I remember recommending uh, Chifuti safaris to someone in the past, you know, which was at the top of what was basically a top level free range hunting outfitter in Africa, only to have that company go to shit and eventually dissolve. You know, Craig Boddington takes a lot of crap for his Boddington endorsed outfitter program. You know, he really promotes his outfitters, but when the service or quality of those outfitters take a crap, people tend to blame Boddington and start uh, accusing him of uh, selling out his fans for free hunts. You know, the fact that Boddington endorses outfitters is probably the biggest stain on his reputation. And I think I've learned from his mistakes and I won't do that myself. Right now, at this moment, in May of 2023, 
I'd say that Charlton McCallum Safaris is probably the best value for a quality free range hunting experience. You know, if a real hunting experience is important to you, you know, some people can't handle the realities of a real hunt. <laughs> you know, and that, and that brings me to my last point. My expectations for a hunt might be vastly different than yours. You know, on my hunt last year, if you watch the video, I specifically asked for the toughest free range buffalo hunt that they had. And it turned out to be one of the greatest experiences of my life. But, uh, but honestly, most people, I think, would have hated that hunt. Walking 15 to 20 miles a day in 100 degree heat isn't for everyone, you know. Sleeping in a, in a hut in the tropics with no electricity while living off a of camp meat for two weeks also isn't for everyone. You know, like most things in life, doing your own exhaustive research and making your own decisions is the only way that you're ever going to plan a trip that meets all of your personal expectations. And our next question is from Carl from Provo, Utah. I always get the greatest questions from Provo. Carl wrote, I found your mass shooting video very intriguing. It was a different angle on a subject that gets bantered back and forth with the same talking points from both sides. Your presentation was as objective as a conservative could be. I am not a conservative, but I am also not anti-gun. That video and your hunting ethics video connected with me because your outlook is refreshingly different. You didn't jump to any conclusions in that video, but pointed out that something did happen about 2010, 2011 that changed the mental health of our young people. You postulated that it might be the so-called rope revolution that happened at the same time. And you might be right. No one else is presenting that argument with evidence. You also briefly alluded to social media's role in the declining mental health of young people. I feel like your video should have explored this further. 2010 to 2011 is when Facebook took off and doubled in size in one year. This is also the same time that Instagram and Snapchat launched. This data would also coincide with your mass shootings versus mental health charts. I believe social media is enhancing, is enhancing mental illness. What do you think? Well, what a great letter. And I agree with you. The social media explosion happened during that same time period. You're right. And maybe I should have explored that topic a little bit further. But you know, I, I see damage that social media is doing all the time. You know, I, I see it damaging people all the time. But it isn't just young people. Older people are also negatively affected by it. You know, I, I see so many women, you know, often beautiful women, filter the hell out of every picture they post on the Internet. You know, and it's not just young ladies doing that. My mother-in-law does it, too. Many uh, scientific peer-reviewed studies have proven that these filtered social media pictures are causing depression, low self-esteem, and anxiety. You know, there's just no way that anybody can live up to their fake social media persona. And, you know, I hate to say this, but American parents let their children spend way too much time on social media you know, especially alone without their supervision. You know, although Africans and South Americans are addicted to social media more than we are in the United States, you know, we're still pretty bad. Um, you know, Europeans and Asians have spend way less time on social media than we do in the United States. Men and women, boys and girls have all created just fake versions of themselves where They've become filtered to the point that they're more avatars and cartoons than real people. I mean, some of these people even have multiple accounts with fictitious people on them. You know, they, they filter their looks to the point where it's almost comical and they post false accomplishments and fake interests in order to garner nothing but attention. Social media 
has created a, a mentally ill society where attention is now our only satisfaction. You know, even wealth doesn't satisfy people anymore. You know, if they can't use that wealth to get more attention on social media. Today's mass shooters aren't psychopaths or deranged people killing out of bloodlust. They're attention seekers. Our next question is from Paul from California. Paul wrote, I am almost afraid to broach this subject so as not to give anti-hunting and anti-fishing groups any ideas to be more emboldened. It might just be my imagination, but I've been plagued in the last few years with what feels like passive harassment while hunting and fishing. Have you experienced harassment or a sense of harassment while trying to enjoy your outdoor activities? And Paul gave me several lengthy examples of harassment that he's experienced while hunting and fishing. But uh, yeah, Paul, I've experienced both overt harassment and I guess what you refer to as passive harassment. I've had people deliberately skip stones on the water right where I was fishing, which would probably classify as passive harassment, you know, all the way up to a lady driving around her Subaru on fire roads in D8, honking her horn and yelling on a PA system during the uh, opening morning of deer season, you know, which is overt harassment. As you probably figured out, <laughs> I'm not shy or passive when it comes to dealing with self-righteous leftists. You know, if, if they want to match wits or fists with me, I won't back down. You know, uh, what you'll usually find, though, is that 99% of them are actually cowards. You know, they believe that being loud and obnoxious makes them important. And in their city environment, they get away with it. But out in the woods, that shit doesn't fly. I've conversed with countless game wardens over the years. And there's one thing that pisses off game wardens worse than a firearm or hunting-related violation, and that's hunter harassment. If you call the game warden because you're being harassed, I guarantee that the warden will come down hard on people who harass hunters and anglers. Hunter harassment is actually illegal in all 50 states, and you could get a one-year jail sentence here in California for hunter harassment. My advice is to be vocal with people harassing you while you're hunting or fishing. You know, tell them to stop. You know, pull out your cell phone and record yourself telling them to stop. If they refuse to stop, call the game warden and let him deal with it. And trust me, they do take it seriously. But as hunters and anglers, we have to be proactive with these people. The worst thing you can do for all hunters and anglers is to ignore their behavior. And our last letter is from Mike in Washington. Mike wrote, I love the Tibor Reel video. I go to the Seychelles once every few years with members of our fly fishing group. Most of us have old Tibors or Able Super Series that we've been using for many trips. I have met Ted Jaraksic several times and he is a great human being and a shining example of the American dream. I cracked up when you pointed out how the industry works. Manufacturers constantly release new products that are supposed to be better than their old products, and the retail and media industry jumps up to promote them as the new best thing. I see that you fish Tibor reels, load 30 out 6, and shoot Model 70 rifles, so I take it you're immune to these tactics. <laughs> That's very observant of you. <laughs> I am 100% immune to marketing hype, in my opinion, you know, but I'm very receptive to new technology and advancements in engineering and design, but I take a very objective look at things and compare it to what I already have. Retailers in the, the, the outdoor media rely on constant product releases to push sales. You know, what good is a T-Bore reel or a Model 70 to them if it's a product that you'll keep in use for 50 years? 
You know, the, the industry hates products like that. You know, to me, it doesn't matter if it's a truck, a motorcycle, a reel, a ham radio, a gun, or a cartridge. If it isn't better than what I already have, I'm not going to buy it. You know, don't let industry marketing decide what you need. Well, uh, that's all the questions for this month. Here's some memes for the month of May. Some of you might have noticed that I posted a video of me fireforming, loading, and shooting some 223 Ackley Improved rounds. And a few minutes after I posted that video, the video just disappeared. Well, YouTube claimed that I violated their policy and they removed that video. I did file a dispute with them, but uh, you know, you never win those against YouTube. At least I never have, anyway. So. That video is gone. <laughs> I do have a couple of uh, hunting related videos coming out in June on topics that you've probably never seen covered on YouTube before. So hit that subscribe and notification button so you don't miss out on those videos. June is the month where the kids are out of school, the weather warms up, and the fishing picks up. And I hope everyone has a great June. You could follow me by hitting my insty at Desert Dog Hunting. You can also send me questions or comments at Desert Dog Outdoors at gmail.com. Thank you for watching, and as always, good hunting. <laughs>